Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome to the video. Welcome to my garage. In this video, we're going to be making an axle for Ratchet. Before we go any farther in this video, let's address the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is, why do I run U-joint axles? Number one, what we're talking about here are axles, not drive shafts. When a lot of people think about U-joint drive shafts, they're thinking of drive shafts. Drive shafts are from the engine to the transmission primarily, and they basically in fourth gear spin at engine RPM. Axles, which is what I'm running, are after your ring and pinion. Let's say my ring and pinion in this transmission, this transaxle is a 5.14. Let's pretend it's a five. Let's say my engine's at 3,500 RPM. If this was a drive shaft in fourth gear, which let's assume that's a one to one ratio, my drive shaft would be going 3,500 RPM. But in an axle setup, my engine is at 3,500 RPM, my ring and pinion is five, so my uh, axles then are not going 3,500 RPM, they're going 700 RPM. So bear in mind, these are spinning at much less RPM than what you typically think of when you're thinking of U-joints because those are typically in a drive shaft. U-joints vibrate when they go around. They kind of do. If your angles are not exactly the same at both angles, and if your uh, if your U joints are not clocked, when I say clocked, clocked means when both of the yokes are at the same orientation. So when you set up a drive shaft or an axle, whatever you're setting up with U joints, you want the uh, U joints to be in line with each other on the drive shaft or the axle. That means that they're clocked. If the angles are the same, and if the drive shaft or the axle is clocked, then the different rotating speeds of U-joints should neutralize itself. Now, I'm not a scientist, so I can't say that, like, I can't prove it, but that's what everything that you look up states. So in my rear suspension design, if you'll notice, my spindle doesn't change at all. It rides parallel with the transaxle, and the reason that I'm doing that is so that the angles on my axle are always the same because if I do that and this is properly clocked or phased the vibration aspect of it should be gone. There might still be some vibrations as the center portion of the shaft speeds up and slows down maybe I'm not sure but the way I get past that is my RPMs are so low I don't really think that that could be an issue. Now the next item is absolutely true. People say that the U-joint axles destroy the side cases and the differential housing bearings in tracks transaxles. If you have a trailing arm setup, and with a trailing arm setup, when your suspension goes to full droop, the spline extends because the distance between your transaxle and your hub change dramatically on trailing arm. So what happens is the axle extends and then when you land, the first thing that happens is the drive shafts have the axles have to shorten and what happens is on an axle setup like this with these splines when you put a little bit of twisting force on here they still slide but they're more difficult to slide like and this is just me putting a little bit of human torque on here and it gets more difficult to slide so what happens is on an actual vehicle where there's a lot of force, whether you're accelerating, decelerating, or when the tires hit the ground, or just the rotating mass of the tires, there's always torque either forward or backwards on that spline. And when the suspension lands, and that has to compress, the resistance of that spline actually puts an incredible amount of pressure on either end of your axle. And the end of your axle that's connected to the hub, those bearings are very strong. They're designed for the tire and all that, so they're much stronger than the bearings in your uh, transaxle. So what happens is the hub assembly can handle that torque or that pressure, the transaxle cannot. So what happens is you'll break your trans transaxle side cover or it'll push in and actually put undue stress on your bearings. So that part is absolutely true, and I do not recommend people with trailing arm run U-joint axles. However, I'm running H-arm rear suspension, or you could call it A-arm rear suspension, I'm, and I'm specifically designing it so that when my suspension is going through, the geometry of the rear suspension 
is in line with the geometry of the axle. So my rotational points are at the same points as the uh, U-joints. So what happens is when my suspension travels, technically my axle should not be moving at all. And so basically that aspect is null and void on a, on a setup like mine. A lot of people ask me if I'm doing it because I think U-joints are stronger. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know which ones are stronger, honestly. That's not why I do it. So when it comes down to it, I explained to you the things that people say as to why you can't do it. And I explained why, at least in my head, I don't think that applies to my situation. The reason that I do it is in a situation like I'm in right now where I'm fabricating and I'm also kind of designing as I go along, because with, a, uh, with an axle like this, I've got so much play in the drive shaft. As I'm going along and I'm building this and I'm making some tweaks and adjustments, if I want to make ratchet two inches narrower, this, this drive shaft will handle that. If I want to make it two inches wider, this drive shaft will handle that. So it allows me to make some adjustments over time without having to buy you know, a completely new um, axle assembly. If I went CVs, I would go non-plunging CVs. Those are about $275 at each end. And then from what I've looked, an axle would cost, uh, looks like six to $900. Um, so that's pretty pricey. I wouldn't want to do all that and then find out I wanted to make it one inch wider or one inch narrower and then have to order a new axle. Um, with the drive shaft, first of all, all of this right here is about 400 bucks and, and it's adjustable to a certain extent. And if I need to make some changes on here, I wouldn't have to scrap the whole thing because a lot of it can be taken apart. So those are the reasons why I'm running U-joint axles in Mahler. I'll be running U-joint axles in Ratchet. Once Ratchet gets dialed in, there's a possibility I might switch to CVs because there's a lot of benefits to CVs. Um, one major flaw with U-joint axles like this, this is heavy. This is going to be heavy. It's a heavy assembly. The other one is if one end of this breaks, a U-joint axle or drive shaft really kind of does a cartwheel effect. And if you don't have hoops on your under your chassis or on your control arms, you could cause some serious damage. CVs don't do that. If you break a CV, they just kind of fall down and, and spin. It's, it's no big deal. So there are some drawbacks to U-joints. But for my application, I like running them. I think they'll be more than strong initially for Ratchet. If Ratchet ends up building big horsepower one day and he breaks these axles, or I think he's going to break them or whatnot, I'll upgrade to CVs. But at this point in the project, this is why I'm going with U-joints. Also bear in mind, these are axles. In this video, you're probably gonna hear me call them drive shafts a lot, and that is because when I look at this and when I hold this, it feels like a drive shaft because usually when you see this, it is a drive shaft. So in the video, I'm probably gonna call this drive shaft many times. It's an axle. So here's the parts I'm going to be using. Starting at the transaxle, I've got a flange yoke adapter. And then I've got a 1310 U-joint. And then I've got a four inch slip um, spline, whatever you would call that. This is the, the spline part right through there. And then I've got a piece of drive shaft that I've cut here. This is not cut to length. This is a little bit too long. Then back here on this end, I've got 5-760X U-joints. And that's because that's what is used on this axle shaft. This axle shaft is actually made for Jeep Wranglers. So it's a slightly larger U-joint on this end. And then I cannot get a, a U-joint adapter that is um, made for welding onto a drive shaft for, or for a 5-760X U-joint. So what I'm doing is I have another one of these axle stub shafts. This one is chromoly. This is the one I'll actually be using in my hub assembly. This one is not chromoly, and the reason this one's not chromoly is because I'm actually going to cut it off right about here. And I'm going to weld it on the drive shaft like that. And you'd be surprised at how well that fits on there. So let's take it over. <clears throat> I've got everything propped in position here. So let's kind of 
mock the drive shaft up in place and then I can take a measurement to see how long I need to cup that shaft for. Okay, now I've got things propped into position here. I've got the flange adapter bolted onto the transaxle. I've got the slip yoke just propped in place and it's in line with the holes there so it's it's in the location it would be if it had a u-joint in there and then I did the same thing back here I've got the stub axle slid in place and then this stub axle is in place and it's in line with the u-joints so now I just need to take a measurement from that surface to this surface and that'll tell me how long I need to cut that section of drive shaft to Ten and a quarter inches. Ten and a quarter. All right, let me catch you up to speed as to where we are. You just saw me cut the stub axle, and basically all I did is I just cut it off right there to leave me this surface. And this is the surface that I will be welding onto the drive shaft. And when I said you'd be surprised how well it fits, it has, if you can see that in the video, it has a little bit of a step on there and this drive shaft is two and a half inch outside diameter pi 0 0.083 wall thickness. That's what this slip yoke is designed for. So as you can see, this is basically a press fit that presses right in there. It's all, it's all set up for that. So although this still needs to be weld, once you press this in there, it's a really, really nice connection. However, this is just not designed for that at all, obviously, but it does have this little step on here, which Believe it or not, if you line that up with the drive shaft, if you can see that, that little step flange almost perfectly locks into the inside of this pipe, which is just a, a mere coincidence, but it's gonna make it so that it basically self-centers this yoke onto the end of the pipe, and it's, it's really nice and straight, so that is really working to my advantage. But, Last night, I did skip a couple of steps that I did not film, and I don't like when I do that because I skipped a couple of good steps. So I'm gonna run you up onto the, the loft up above and show you a couple things I did. So like I said, and like you saw, I cut this tube on the bandsaw, and my bandsaw actually makes a really nice cut. I would say it gets you about 95, 96% to within a perfect 90 degree but it's not a perfect 90 degree. For cutting just uh, roll cage tubing and stuff, that's great, but for doing things like this, a drive shaft piece, I really need that to be, let's say 99% of a true 90 degree, and I need to have a nice smooth surface there to work with. So after I cut it with the bandsaw, I came up to my disc sander here, and I spent a lot of time with a square edge, number one, squaring up this platform so that it's 90 degrees to the wheel. And I also spent a lot of time squaring up this square so that it is also square to the disc here. And then what I did is I took the tube. You don't want to just take your tube and press it onto there because you're not going to get you're not going to get a nice 90 that way. But if you put it on here and then you just slowly rotate it and do several rotations and then as you're doing that keep taking it off and checking it so if you guys can see this is a a really good 90 degree and it's a really really clean true surface 
and this this surface was too. So once I did that, and that took a while, it took quite a while to square all these up, um, but I did that and I got both both ends of these really crisp 90s. Then I came over here to my little press and I put the piece on there and I just with my press smashed all this together and basically what I was doing at that point is there's there's about a half inch flange down in here that gets pressed onto here and I was just pressed it on there and then pressed it real tight basically just making sure that this edge here is flush all the way around that I didn't have like a gap on one side and not the other all right so now I'm getting ready to start tacking this together and because these are cast pieces first thing I like to do with this cast stuff is just heat it up with the propane torch otherwise when you start to tack it or you start to weld it the the heat travels through the cast and it, it causes things to crack it causes your tacks to crack and it's really not good so I like to preheat them with the torch a little bit and then what I'll do is I'll run around and I'll just put some small tacks in place just all the way around just to hold it straight and make sure that it's nice and true before I start doing my my actual welding now that I've got it actually tacked in place and I've, I've checked it and I'm, I'm real happy with it what I'm gonna do here is I'm starting to do what I call a, a cut-in weld but really it's just a small weld where I'm not using the filler material because what I'm trying to do is dig the heat down and get the cast piece and the tubing to to work together at really low in the piece so that I get deep penetration and I'm not throwing a lot of heat at it either because like I said this is still a cast piece and this welding is still working to really really heat up this cast piece and when I do my next weld this piece will be fully warmed up from this pass that I'm doing all the way around. I'm just doing it in strips to distribute the heat. All right, now I've got that weld that goes all the way around and the piece is nice and hot and it's ready to go. So now I'm doing what I call my final weld, which I'm using the filler material and I'm making a nice, I'm not gonna say a big weld, but I'm not, I'm not being cheap or I'm not being sparingly with the filler rod. I'm, I'm making sure that I completely envelop the weld that I just laid down and that I'm getting good penetration into the, the tubing and penetration onto the cast piece. And now I'll do this all the way around and then when I'm done with this I will just let the piece sit and let it cool all on its own. All right, now we're working on the other piece. Now, you won't see me you won't see me tacking stuff very often without gloves, but what I'm doing here is I'm using my hands so that I can feel if the piece moves at all because although this piece had that little step which kind of locks it into position, because this isn't a press fit like the slip yoke was on the other end, I wanted to make sure that I had my fingers on there so that I could tell if something moved or jumped when I tacked it on there. So I didn't use my gloves when I was doing the initial tacks, but you can see now that I've got a couple tacks going, I'm, I'm using my gloves again. And there's also a step that I did not show here. I did not preheat that piece with my uh, map gas torch before I tacked it because I knew I was going to use my hands on it. So once I got those little tiny tacks in place and I had it held in place, then I heated it up as quickly as I could with the map gas torch. Um, so now it's been heated up. Now I'm doing what I was doing before where I'm doing my, my cutting in or my dig in weld where I weld all the way around it, but I'm not using filler rod. I'm just getting down as deep as I can and bringing the two pieces together so that I can, number one, get deep penetration, but number two, get that part nice and hot before I do my, my final pass after this one. 
And you can also see I, I made a nice contraption to hold this at a nice, comfortable angle so that I can get, get in there real easily. All right, now that I've got that, that cutting in pass all the way around and everything's nice and hot, now I'm going at it one more time and just like on the other piece, now I'm using the, the filler rod and I'm getting real, a nice, a nice weld that caps the weld that I just did and gets good penetration on the tube and good penetration on the cast piece. So this one I'm walking it all the way around and this one, this one I'm really making it so it counts. And now that the welds are done and everything's cool, I'm just up here on the loft putting the U-joints together. I actually don't enjoy this too much because sometimes the U-joints can be a little bit difficult, but these these seemed to go to, together okay. Everything here was brand new, so it was it was pretty straightforward. And now that I've got everything, I'm just assembling it before I start talking with you guys to make sure that everything I did actually works and things fit. All right, there she is nestled into place. You can see the stub shaft is in there. Draft shaft comes out here. I've got about two inches I can go this way, two inches I can go this way. And then the flange adapters, I just got one bolt in there for now. I'm real happy with the way it came out. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with this as an axle. This is what I'm gonna use to build and design off of. We'll see if one day I upgrade this to CVs, but for now, I'll build her up like this, and I'm, I'm real happy with this. I, you know, who, who could tell if I'll break it someday, but I, it, it seems like it's pretty strong. This is the next piece that I needed in the design of the rear suspension because I need the drive shaft in place so that when I design the lower control arm here, I know how much room I need to allow for the this portion of the axle when I'm in full droop and things like that. Same thing with over here. I need to find out how much clearance I have under here. So I, I couldn't do too much more design without having the axle in place. So now with this, I can start laying out where the, the rear shock absorbers are gonna go. I'll know how much clearance I need to allow for the drive shaft and just all sorts of things that I can't, I couldn't just guess whether I had clearance for the axle or not. I needed to actually have it in place. Then of course, the axle here and the U-joints play the biggest role in how much droop I can go because the droop is always limited by the angle of the axle, so I definitely needed this in place so that I could cycle things and find out where I need to have the locations of the shock absorbers and all sorts of stuff. It, it was it was def definitely the next step. All right, guys, that is it for this video. I'm real happy to have this done. This was the next step in the design of the rear suspension. Um, with having the shock absorbers on the lower control arm and all that, I couldn't guess as to what kind of space this was going to take up. So now I can start moving forward with on the design and I'm real happy with how this turned out. So that's great. So thanks for watching the video. I hope it's helping you guys with whatever you might be working on and I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.